You're listening to Kitchen Table Finance. Join Dave Shotwell and Nick Nauta as they cut through the complexity of financial planning and serve bites of investment advice that are both personal and practical. Hey, Dave, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Nick. How are you? Good. Friday. Can't complain. Yeah. Fall is here, but the sun is shining. Uh, I'm hoping it uh, gets up here soon (laughs) because... It is not looking very pretty out today, but it'll get there. Yeah. So I don't know about you, but I'm super excited about today's topic. So we kind of thought we've done a lot of book reviews. We talk a lot about books, but there are actually some movies about money. So we wanted to kind of highlight some of our favorites and uh, talk through some of the famous movies about money. Yeah. Yeah. I love this topic. Um, So I don't inner English major nerd. Absolutely. And I don't think we can start a topic about movies about money without starting with the film Wall Street, right? Classic, right? <laughs> it was the, the, uh, the, this is what everybody in our generation thought being a stockbroker was all about. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pinstripe suits and yep. uh, suspenders. <laughs> yep. The uh, expensive Manhattan uh, apartment. And, oh, uh, yeah. you know, so, so yeah, Charlie Sheen as a, a very young Charlie Sheen as Bud Fox, beginning stockbroker, trying to make yep. his way in the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, he ends up giving insider information about an airline that his dad happens to be the uh, head of the union for to uh, a corporate raider named good old Gordon Gecko. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Michael <laughs> Douglas. And, uh, Movie's probably most famous for its uh, "greed is good" speech, mm-hmm. and um, Gordon Gecko kind of came to typify the 1980s corporate raider, no conscience type of Wall Street uh, tycoon. Yeah, and uh, it was. I think it's it's kind of seen today as embodying all like the worst things of that. Uh, Mm -hmm. culture of the 80s the very materialistic uh approach to life yeah it's interesting because you know bud fox is kind of what's supposed to be like the hero of the story to some degree right Mm -hmm. but you know in your experience i'm sure you've run into this dave there's people that like follow gordon gecko like the greed is good like that was their mantra and they were going to live well, by it right it was almost it, it, it was almost like giving the okay yeah to corporate excess and capitalism right if right you know um with with the the idea you know behind capitalism is that you know rational economic actors are going to act in their best interest but that that mm-hmm. drives the economy forward and gordon just took that to the extreme and just said hey my greed is good <laughs> yeah. and uh if 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 i happen to hurt a few people along the way well their greed wasn't good enough i guess right yeah and um so, and yeah, you know, it's got the classic redemption story of uh, Bud Fox, you know, trying mm-hmm. to uh, undo the wrong he's done by giving Gordon the uh, inside information, but definitely worth a watch. It holds up. I watched it again, maybe three or four years ago, and I was surprised yeah. actually at how, how I still enjoyed it. Yeah, no, it, it definitely, you know, for it's just a classic 80s movie, um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> definitely still holds up. And they actually did a, a sequel. I don't know if you saw Wall Street 2. You know, I know of it, but I don't remember ever seeing it. Yeah, basically, uh, Gordon Gecko is um, obviously older and he's got a daughter and a shy LaBoo. I don't oh know if yeah, Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, yeah. Shia LaBeouf is the uh, the next up and coming Bud Fox who's dating Gordon Gecko's daughter. So oh yeah, that makes it's sense. It's interesting. I thought it was pretty good, but uh, you know, obviously, yeah. I have ties well, a good to the industry. Too. So, yeah. Um, but it was yeah, they did a sequel. Yeah, interesting. So <laughs> the the next one on our list, I don't know that you've seen this one, but uh, I've always considered it a classic um, morality story about. Uh, about the sales culture around investing and um it, it's called Glen Gary Glen Ross and it's kind of a lesser known movie but it stars like a 
like a who's who of the early 90s acting scene with Jack Lemmon, Al Pacino, Alec Baldwin, Alan Arkin, Ed Harris, Kevin Spacey. Yeah. All these guys came together and uh, it's it's basically the story about four days in the lives of these guys that are working for a real estate investment firm doing developments. And they're they're basically selling shares in this development to everyday folks, mostly retirees. Okay. And kind of the so there there's a lot going on with their interactions with clients, but then also their interactions among themselves because it's really this bloodthirsty sales culture and they actually get in a huge pickle about stealing leads. It's all about this list of names of potential hmm. people that would be gullible enough to invest in this project, <laughs> which is really, I mean, that's, that's really, it's, it's not a good investment plan for these folks, yeah. but they've got these leads and these leads are, are verified as folks that have money and are ready to invest. And these guys just basically hose each other over trying to get those names and the list gets stolen and they accuse each other. And it's, 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 so it's, it's a, it's an interesting movie on a lot of levels and at it's hard is really from my point of view is about what like high stakes competitive mm -hmm. money issues can do to people. Yeah. Interesting. More people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's on my uh, list now of, uh, you of should, movies yes. to watch. So yeah, I got it. I got it queued up on Amazon on prime video, but well, um, and you know, I think part of um, like for you and me with a couple of these movies and the same is true of wall street is that some of it like echoes back to like the training things we went through early in our careers. Mm, yeah. And you know, there's some classic scenes with, uh, with uh, Alec Baldwin as the sales manager, basically standing in front of this room full of salesmen and berating them for their, for their, how much, you know, they're just not doing enough. And, you know, you can't have coffee. Coffee's for closers. And, yeah. you know, always ABC, always be closing, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so there's a lot of that in it too. And uh, anyway, it's a, uh, it's, it's a very good movie for on a lot of levels. Yeah, you bring up a good point about like the the training that we took through, and we and we've done on the podcast a yeah. couple different times talking about like how we got here and how we became fee only financial planners, and that you know part of the reason is we sat through those sales trainings <laughs> yeah. and we're like this this is not me, right? Like, right, right. <laughs> I don't want to sell a real estate investment trust to an yeah. old lady that doesn't need it or whatever. Well, come on, Nick, maybe. it's going to pay you a seven percent commission. <laughs> yeah. How can it right. be bad? <laughs> Um, so, so yeah. And, uh, uh, then both of us kind of came together to make sure this one was on the list, the big oh, yeah. short mm -hmm. and, uh, great movie, great, uh, characters and acting based on a pretty salient event in all of our lives. Um, and does a really good job of, uh, explaining some really complex baloney that was going on at the time with collateralized default options and uh, different mortgage backed security structures. Right. Um, you get Margot Robbie in a bathtub explaining to you how uh, collateral default, uh, yeah. collateralized <laughs> default um, obligations work and Anthony Bourdain using a right. pot of, pot of uh, leftover chicken or leftover uh, seafood stew to explain uh, mm -hmm. how uh, packaged security, ha packaged mortgage securities get built, yeah. <laughs> throwing, throwing the old fish in with the new fish to kind of create something that was, <laughs> you know, somewhat palatable. Right. Um, so no, I thought they did a fantastic job of those explanations. Yeah. I read the yeah. book and the book oh, was yeah. kind of confusing when it came to a lot of those you know, higher yeah. end explanations of things. And the movie yeah. just like did a phenomenal job. Like you didn't need to know anything about finances going in to be able mm -hmm. to understand kind of where they were going with a lot of that, yeah. which is hard to do. Yeah. No. So, so also too, though, I feel obligated to point out, you know, one of the trouble spots, and I just rewatched this a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, the one thing I would say about it is with, um, like Christian Bale's character and uh -huh. um, Steve Carell's character, where they're the hedge fund managers that kind of figured out what was going on and shorted the the housing market and profited from it. They, it gives it does give them this sense. Of, it gives a sense of oh my gosh, this was so obvious, and these guys were so um, 
you know, um, so far ahead of the game. And you just, and we want to like extrapolate that as though it was, it should always be obvious. Mm -hmm. And there's always going to be people that can figure this out. Well, you know, some of it is, is the old um, stopped clock is right twice a day adage, you know, right. Uh, We've got to be careful not to make too much of certain parties getting certain things right at certain times, because there's going to be a lot of instances where those same people are going to be wrong. You're absolutely right. And, you know, well, the thing is, they don't make movies about people that get wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. Not, not right. that type of wrong. Yeah. 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 So, so, but great movie and, yeah. uh, high, and just a, a fun one to watch for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah. And just a next, really good way to understand like what happened in 2008 yeah, and like yeah. bring that back to like why it may or may not happen again um, yeah. in that same way so yeah so um next on our list um sticking i guess we've kind of got a theme going here uh boiler room Mm -hmm. it's one of my one of my favorites um starring Mm -hmm. giovanni rabisi um you know playing a a kid who dropped out of college to run a casino in his in his his basement i believe it was (laughs) he gets gets this job working as a stockbroker because his dad who's a federal judge um doesn't have any respect for him because he's not legit he thinks okay you know i'm gonna go i'm gonna go be a be a investment advisor and be respectable and you know have this career and finds out that the brokerage firm he's working for is basically scamming people right like like running what we call a pump and dump scheme where they're where they're buying penny stocks in selling them to people to inflate the price. And then the firm of course owns a lot of that stock and sells it before anybody else can get out. And yeah. Um, you know, it's super interesting dynamic about like not being able to sell the stock. So not right. like having That's to convince thing people to buy that they, are, right. they shouldn't sell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so there, there's a lot going on and a lot, again, it, it has a lot of the, um, the 1980s 1990s sales culture involved and i'll never forget the scene and this is why we kind of put these in this order is that um there's a scene where all these trainees are all in this room and they're supposed to be studying for their series seven exam and they end up watching wall street and are all reciting verbatim the gordon gecko greet his good speech as he's giving it on screen and thinking they are you know going to go be part of this great you know investment world uh you know where they're sharks and tycoons and you know really they're just scamming little old ladies out of their hard-earned money yeah and um so it's it's again shining the light on the ugly predator side of the business yeah the predator sales culture side um you know yeah, yeah. We seem to have a theme going on with all. <laughs> we these do. Movies, well, right? <laughs> you, you know, we're gonna we're gonna try to wrap up on a more positive note, but we <laughs> really had to dig hard to find um, money movies that we liked that that yeah. uh, were also positive. Uh, right. You know, a couple that didn't make the list, uh, and there's there's still good movies: American Psycho and, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and Wolf of Wall Street. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> um, interestingly enough, uh, in one of the blurbs about Boiler Room. Uh, Jordan, I'm going to draw a blank on his last Belfort. name, the Belfour. Thank you. The, um, the Wolf of Wall Street is supposed to be a loosely based biography of also claimed that Boiler Room was a, a biography of him too. Yeah. So, so yeah, proud, proud moments. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so another one that we both liked and this one's a little more positive, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and by the same author as the big short, uh, Michael Lewis, who was, yeah. was himself a bond trader back in the eighties, um, money ball. And yeah. uh, a lot of people are gonna be like, Oh, that doesn't have anything to do with investing. But boy, uh, to me, it was the best investing allegory movie I've seen ever. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, the idea that baseball, baseball managers and scouts spend all their time building a story around a, I want to say recruit because I pay more attention to college football, but around these uh, major league baseball prospects and these intangibles that only a manager could identify. Right. Right. Um, And 
in their search for um, for finding value in players because they didn't have much money to work with. The Oakland A's start analyzing statistics mm-hmm. and looking for real true value guys that nobody's heard of that they can pick up for a bargain price. Right. And you know, why do we want him? Cause he gets on base, you know, he's yep. not, he's not, he's, he doesn't hit, he's not going to hit for 400, but he walks all the time and knows not to swing. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's not sexy and it's not exciting, but he gets on base, you know, and yep. it, it really is a story about value investing. Right. Yeah. It's about, you know, ignoring the the story behind the stocks and finding value in the idea that these some of these companies that are not as flashy and, and exciting are going to trade at lower cost to earn, or price to earnings multiples and give you opportunity to make more money over the long haul. Yeah, absolutely. Following the the Billy Bean story, and he Billy really Bean. did change baseball. Like if you look mm-hmm. now, that back, back then nobody had an analytics department. Now everybody right. does, right? Back, you know, yep. baseball is this old, you know, hundred year old sport where they, you know, managed yep. by gut instinct for a long, long time. Right. Until B- Billy Bean came around and kind of changed the game. So yeah, you know, I I added this this little comment to our notes on it though. You know, so so in in investing, right when 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 enough people, enough investors pick up on a trend, the value of that trend goes away, right? right. Mm-hmm. Arbitrage. So if if um, if baseball managers all pick up on the fact that a guy who bunts or walks well might be more valuable than than his salary would 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 show, they're going to end up paying more for those players and drive the price up, right? Their right. that value will go away. Well, in value investing. And I think this applies in baseball prospects too. If you think about it, the one reason that value, what we call the value premium in the market exists is because it's psychologically hard. Yeah. And I'm stealing this from Daniel Crosby, uh, author of the behavioral investor, but you know, like the Christmas effect in the stock market has pretty much been arbitraged away. So it used to be that just based on the calendar, you would see the stock market start to go up in December as people, um, looked at uh looked at um you know certain things in the markets and right and coming into the year end so what happened is people started to buy into the market earlier anticipating the market would go up in december and what that meant is the market starts going up in in november instead of december right Right. (laughs) it just moved and so so the 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 value of that goes away but because buying a beaten up stock that's not looking very good on paper is psychologically more difficult than buying the exciting, you know, story stock. Yeah. The value premium, even though analytically everyone knows it exists, is still psychologically hard for investors to do. And I I bet, um, you know, there may not be reams of data on this yet, but I bet it's the same with baseball players that those managers still struggle with picking up this player, like maybe not all the time, but they're not building an entire roster the way Billy Bean was. Right. Absolutely. So, well, and, you know, you think about it, baseball is, you know, if you're batting 300, you're yeah. a great player. <laughs> yeah. Right. Three right. out of every 10 times you're at the plate, you get a hit. Right. right. So like, right. And that's your average. So you're going to have stretches where you go below that. So the, yeah. the hard part is you got a guy that's struggling. How do you just wait and let the law of averages come back to where yeah. you should be at? Yeah. Or do you, you know, buck the trend and just replace him with somebody else. And yeah. the analogy to investing is, and we see this all the time with value investing and what we do, Dave, is that there's cyclical trends in the market, right? So right. growth investments might outperform for a period of time. And so if you're a value investor, if you're tilted toward value, the, the hard part is, well, maybe I should go and put more into growth. And usually mm-hmm. that's about the time where the trend when you flips shouldn't. the other way, yeah. right? Yeah. And so we're looking at like long-term trends, but it's much harder to stick with right. a long-term trend when things aren't going well. Right. Right. So that was the best, that was the best I could do with a, for coming up with a positive money movie. You did a little better than I did. I think I, I haven't it. seen this what? one. Well, after I saw American Psycho was on the list of the top 10, uh, I figured I could make a connection to uh, a movie called The Pursuit of Happiness. Yeah. Uh, so The Pursuit of Happiness is uh, Will Smith plays uh, real life salesman Chris Gardner. 
okay. set in San Francisco in 1981, and, and Chris is selling some sort of medical machine. It's mm-hmm. not going very well. His wife's very upset with him <laughs> about <laughs> his decision to spend their life savings on like 10 of these machines, and he even ends uh, up losing one. But through this process, he meets the lead manager and partner for Dean Winter. Dean Witter Reynolds back then, mm-hmm. which is no longer around. It's transformed into something. I couldn't tell I you. I think who it's it all is. the way into Schwab at this point. Yeah, probably. It, it was. It, uh, yeah. But he earned the right, impressed the uh, the the lead partner to become a uh, intern stockbroker, which was an unpaid position. So uh, along the way, his uh, wife left him, and he's in his son. They had a young son played by Will Smith's real life son, um, and hmm. so they went through this like phase when he was this unpaid intern of where he was basically homeless and um, living in like bathrooms, homeless shelters, and just having a heck of a time. And so obviously with having to take care of his son, he had to um, you know be fast because he had less time than everyone else. And so what he would do that was really interesting, instead of like, if you pick up, this is back when you picked up phones, right? Before mm-hmm. cell phones, 1981. But he would pick up the phone to die, like dialing for dollars. He would just have this list of people that he called. And instead of like setting the phone down to hang up, he figured mm-hmm. that wasted time. So he would just click the button and then start dialing again mm-hmm. to get more calls in. But just a story of like, just continuing to pursue eventually he did get a job a full-time job and then left and started his own firm ended up selling it for millions of dollars years Hmm. later so i I guess the tie-in to the financial world is he ended up becoming a you know stock broker if you will Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just an interesting story about not giving up no matter you know how far down on your luck you are yeah. Um, so it's a it's a good movie. It's it's got a little bit of uh, a good ending, a good you know morality boost, and when it comes to the stock market and our profession, um, but also it's a pretty loose tie-in from that standpoint. Yeah. Well, it's but it's it's I think it fits. I think it fits. I'll make a point of watching that in the next few weeks, and uh, I tell you to go watch Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, but uh, it probably won't cheer you up at all. <laughs> uh, just a, a quick correction and a comment I made a second ago because it, it hit me afterwards that it was not right. Dean Witter is now part of Morgan Stanley, not Schwab. Ah, got yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, those are our uh, top six. And, and part of this came out of, Dave, I went last week and watched Dumb Money, which yeah. you haven't watched yet. And since it's so new, I don't want to, like, ruin the story for everyone, mm-hmm. although it's based on a true story. So you can kind of figure it out for yourself. but. Very interesting movie about um, dumb money, which is what some of the institutional investors call retail funds. So Mm -hmm. retail investors would be like me and you going out and and buying 100 shares of a stock, right? Yeah. Where institutional investors are, you know, buying millions of, of certain stocks. And so it's the story of GameStop, which we also did a podcast on when that was happening. Um, So we can throw that in the show notes. And, And one of the interesting things about that movie that we kind of got wrong a little bit was it you know we we did a podcast about GameStop and whether or not you should buy and that part is actually very true and accurate (laughs) however (laughs) the difference was and I didn't realize it at the time is it it was so much more of a movement against Wall Street than I ever even knew and big retail money than I ever knew and that movie does a great job of highlighting that dynamic okay Um, and the guy that kind of, of started it um, just an incredible story of how he persevered through some of that stuff. And by persevered, I mean, he's a crazy man and <laughs> made millions of dollars out of a very little amount of money and held on much longer than I ever would have. So, yeah, uh, yeah. If you get a chance. It's in theaters right now. It's a good watch. Um, so put it on your list as well. All right. That sounds good. That sounds good. Well, this has been very fun, Dave. I appreciate it as always. If you, our listeners, have any uh, movies that you think we should throw on the list or that we miss, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, shoot us an email at info at srbadvisors.com or hit us up on the socials. We're on uh, Facebook and Instagram, so you can find us there. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Nick.
This is a Zedia Media Production.